seems to be fitting properly. Now the other. Mm, that's about right, I think. Oh, yes, perfect, okay. Now the eyes. first attempt. Oh, it's hard for me to say, but I'm afraid you would have been my fifth. I know. Believe me, I know the odds are not in my favor, but I am confident I have learned enough through my failures to get it right this time. My first attempt, well, I hesitate to say attempt. More like experimenting, seeing what worked, what didn't. Well, not refrigerating the brain didn't work. By the time I had all the other parts, well, it had rotted some. I scraped off the green parts and gave it a shot anyway. But as I expected, no good. It's embarrassing to say, but that was not the only misstep in my procedure. You see, I had not consulted the anatomy chart in a while, and well, I may have sewn the arms the wrong way on. No, I can't lie to you. I, I definitely sewed them on backwards. When I realized my mistake, I was too far along to remove and resaw both arms, so I just figured my creation would never have to suffer the pain of being unable to reach that itchy spot in the middle of their back. Hmm. Close. Maybe just the top. Hmm, that should hold for now. Well, like I mentioned, the first one never woke, but still I was not about to give up my life's work. My second attempt went quite better. I had all the pieces in the right place, even triple-checked the arms were on the right way. I was nearly complete, only missing one piece. The heart. Ah, critical oversight on my part. I went to the graveyard one frigid December morning and uh, began to look for fresh soil, but the problem was the snow had begun to fall, and when I got there it quickly covered up the ground. I resorted to poking my shovel into every unmarked grave looking for loose soil. <laughs> Truth be told, I was having so much fun, by the time I found a fresh grave, it was already beginning to fall to dusk. It took three separate coffins before I found a fresh one enough to take some home. So wrapped in burlap and atop my sled, I pulled the corpse all the way through the woods to avoid the prying eyes of the villagers, of course, to my little castle. Well. Well, you see, in my rush to complete my new acquaintance, I neglected to add firewood to the stove, and some of the crows who live in my attic, crafty little devils them. Well, you see, they've learned to unlock my windows so they can come and go as they please. Well, can you imagine my shock when I arrived back home to see all the lamps burned out and nearly three inches of snow atop my beautiful creation? 
Oh, I was furious. I wanted to get my punt gun and just start blasting the winged devils, but oh. Alas, I just couldn't bring myself to harm such beautiful creatures. So I let them be. But not to worry, my beautiful being. I nailed the upper window shut after shooing those pesky birds out. Now they just sit in the old dead tree outside my front door and stare daggers through me as I come and go. They look at me like I kicked them out of their house. <laughs> the absurdity. Oh. <sighs> and I may as well do the other side, otherwise this might keep happening. Let's see. My third attempt, I wanted to make things easier on myself. I found a fresh body, picked up by the docks. With a well-placed bribe and a conveniently open vehicle, the coroner looked the other way and I was able to take the body unquestioned. But it was me who was made a fool of in the end. The man was not dead, just passed out drunk in the snow. When he came to, he thanked me for my hospitality and handed me a, a mitt full of dirty coins before raiding my cabinets of liquor and stumbling back to the village. The money he gave me was less than a quarter of what I paid for him. There we go. That should hold nicely. Well, I suppose it was for the best, as because of him I was able to get a job at the crematorium. A meager work for an accomplished doctor such as myself, and as you can see I'm in no need of the money, but the unique access was more than enough payment. I would simply take whatever I needed and burn the rest. What did the dead care if they were missing an arm or a spleen? And there were never any shortages of bodies, of course, from the mines near town and the gallows for that matter. My fourth attempt was so close I could taste it. I had honed my techniques and finished the basic anatomy, but how to give life? My original plan was to place the body in a warm bath to bring up the temperature and then administer high doses of adrenaline to start the heart. I experimented with different amounts of drugs before I recalled a French scientist who was able to animate live tissue with electricity. A novel concept for sure. I tried a simple stacked cell stoked in ammonia, to no effect. It was obvious I'd need more power, so I built a Baghdad battery with a clay pot full of vinegar, um, copper and lead. And it worked. Finally a reaction. When I inserted the electrified needles into the muscle of the arm, it would twitch. The only solution was more power. I hand-built 45 batteries using several casks of wine that had gone to vinegar. The electricity was so strong I could pull a spark nearly an inch long. But alas, even that was not enough for my great creation. I only had one option left. I placed my creation on a tin table, and with the largest copper cables I could have made, connected the table to the lightning rod on the roof. Surely, if my feeble batteries were not enough, then the power of God would be sufficient. Well, when the lightning struck, the power was a little more than I expected. Not only did I vaporize my cables and blow a hole in my roof, my beautiful creation was detonated limb from limb. Chunks of flesh, fragments of bone coated nearly every surface in my laboratory. Oh, I must say, after the fourth straight day of cleanup, even I was beginning to waver. I spent weeks checking and rechecking my anatomy books. I was sure everything was in the right place, and I knew electricity was my key to all of this, but I just didn't have enough experience. I was just about to give up when I was recommended a book, one by uh, Nikola Tesla. Fascinating Serbian fellow. I found a lot of parallels between himself and mine. 
I found his address and wrote to him in New York City, explaining that I was trying to accomplish the unthinkable. Oh, truthfully, I didn't expect a response. I was used to most people treating me with disdain for my radical beliefs, but sure enough, only four months later, I received a veritable novel oh, from Mr. Tesla himself, explaining in flawless detail how to enslave electricity and make it do my bidding. He included a blueprint for a device he called a vacuum variable capacitor. It alone, he said, would have enough fortitude to contain a lightning strike and allow me to slowly increase the power. He also recommended I use a pulsed or alternating power system instead of direct current. This was the answer I looked for. This reinvigorated me. I immersed myself into the foreign world of electrical sciences. I read the works of Faraday, Watt, Volta, even Edison. Although most of what Edison wrote was already written by Tesla, but that's not the point. I experimented with transformers, motors, dynamos. I irritated the town's machinist to no end with my incessant requests to craft ever more complicated components. I became obsessed. My first attempt to capture lightning were less than successful. I found my cable's diameter insufficient to contain the power, so I resorted to using scraps from a suspension bridge, nearly a hand and a half in diameter thick. I was forced to install a hand winch into my roof as the cables were nearly 200 pounds every two yards. Finally, I was completed, and all I needed was a new test subject. Oh, don't mind that. I'm afraid I have made a foul of the townsfolk as of late. They seem to be increasing in hostility towards me. For what, I have no idea, but I'm only trying to help them, of course. Where was I? Oh, right. I had long quit my job at the crematory, and unfortunately the townsfolk were becoming weary of my activities. So it became much more difficult to find the parts I required. Still, I was able to grease the right palms and get what I needed. The parts I got, your parts I should say, were all so special. Arms of a fisher, and I made sure they were on the right way this time. Legs of a messenger, torso of a fencer, head of a playwright, and mind of a doctor. All the other parts were found where I could get them, but I assure you they were all as good as can be. Oh dear, perhaps I have less time than I expected. Taking your final parts from the funeral home was perhaps too big of a risk. I suppose I should stop reminiscing. There will be plenty of time to talk when you're among the living. I will begin by placing the electrodes into the muscle groups. Abdominals. Biceps. Triceps. Paralysis, obliques, trapezoids, latissimus dorsi, erectus spinatus, glutes, sorry about this, calves, and quadriceps. Next, the neural electrodes carefully placed around the head. Okay, and finally, the vascular spike to stimulate the heart directly. Thirty. 
40. 50. I can see it working. 60. 70. 80. Oh my god, it's really working. 90. 100. success. You and I are going to accomplish so much together. <laughs> but first, we have some work to do. Oh, perhaps with the parts from those ungrateful swine I'll make an army. Shall we?